Hi. So, in this video, let's take the opportunity to finish out section 4.1. And this is mainly just going to be a definition. The, um, the way the textbook presents this material is a little odd, it has to be said. So in section 4.1, it introduces absolute extrema, and it teaches students how to find absolute extrema. Great. You introduce the topic, you do what you want to do with it, you're done with it. It also introduces a concept of local extrema. Then it doesn't do anything with local extrema. Then there's section 4.2, which is nothing to do with extrema at all. And then in section 4.3, back to local extrema. So there are, if I were writing the textbook, I, there are maybe things I would do a little differently. Um, when you try or attempt the quiz, you'll see the quiz is all absolute extrema stuff. But we'll introduce local extrema now, so that when section 4.3 rolls along, we can just talk about the material presented in that section and not have to present a lot of new definitions. So if our goal is clear, let's get this whiteboard up and I won't be visible anyway when I'm in front of the whiteboard so that video can go. And let's look at a function. And let's say we're only looking at this function on a closed interval. So the function might be defined elsewhere, but we're only looking at it on this interval. And maybe our curve looks like that. Like every continuous function on a closed interval, this function has a maximum. Great. But going back to what I said, maybe this function is actually defined everywhere, and we were just looking at it on a closed interval. Maybe the function does something like this, once we're off that closed interval. So now, here's our curve, and this point here, that used to be an absolute extrema, an absolute maximum, isn't anymore. You see, we get above this value over here. So suddenly, this point isn't a maximum. It still looks like a maximum, though. Um, it's a little weird to suddenly say, well, this point does have some property, now suddenly it's lost that property because of something that happened all the way over here, some distance from the point. And that's the idea that relative extrema are supposed to address. So a relative extrema 
can be defined a little in form of the, but I think fair the clear the as follows. Suppose a point could be turned in to an absolute exedrema by erasing part of the graph. Then that point is a relative exedrema. And I think this definition sounds kind of weird until you see it in action, and then it's going to click and make a lot of sense. Suppose we have the following graph. I'm drawing this a little weirdly so that I can use the whiteboard's erase feature. But suppose we have this graph, and we're interested in that point. That point looks like a minimum. I mean, the curve is coming down, it hits a minimum value, and then it goes back up. So it looks like a minimum, but it isn't any sort of absolute minimum, you see, we get well below that value over here. What this curve, or rather what this point is, is a relative minimum. What did I say about relative extrema? I said a point was a relative extrema if you could turn it into an absolute extrema by erasing bits of the graph. In particular, by erasing the bits of the graph that are far away from the point. So let's start erasing. We've erased that. Still not an absolute minimum, but we can erase that. Okay, still not an absolute minimum. We can erase that. And what's happened? Suddenly, our point has transformed into an absolute minimum. So the fact that a racing part of the graph turned this point into an absolute minimum, let's put the rest of the graph in to the extent that I remember it, that makes this point a relative minimum. And a lot of real-world applications of calculus 
are finding relative minima. Um, and that raises the natural question of, okay, first, what applications? Talk is cheap. Can I really give any good applications of this? Um, a, slightly, a slightly less confrontational question that it raises is, okay, so let's assume that we believe you and we are interested in finding these, uh, these local extrema. How do we go about doing that? Uh, ah, there I am. And as I say, the textbook orders this material slightly strangely. We'll come back to this not Thursday. On Thursday, we will be taking an interlude and talking about some theoretical material. But next week, we will come back to this and we'll look at examples of relative extrema, also applications of absolute extrema. That's something we haven't done either. And yes, I will uh, um, hope to see you tomorrow. If I wind up actually on this jury, then I'll post an announcement and I'll post some video like this for you to look at. Um, bye bye.